And with all that, Aaron L. Thompson holds a PhD and a JD from Columbia, the perfect credentials, it turns out, for the post of Associate Professor of Art Crime at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice at the City, of, City University of New York. If you're wondering, her desk's in the college's Department of Art and Music, and she's the only press professor of the field in America. Maybe that's why she's a go-to authority in court cases and televised interviews. Meanwhile, her articles on looted work, uh, monuments, Guantanamo, on fakes, on academia, have appeared in the Washington Post, the New York Times, Smithsonian Magazine, Bitch, Slate, The Nation, and Art in America, among many, many other publications. Beyond her latest book, she's the author of Possession, The Curious History of Private Collectors from Antiquity to the Present, published by Yale in 2016 and named one of NPR's best books of that year. Sarah Merck is a comics journalist, teacher, and editor, a former reporter for The Stranger and The Portland Mercury. She's now a contributing editor at comics publication The Nib and a digital producer at the Center for Investigative Reporting. She is the author of several books, including Guantanamo Voices, which The New York Times named one of the 10 best graphic novels of 2020. Aaron L. Thompson's book, Smashing Statues, The Rise and Fall of America's Public Monuments, is the subject of their discussion tonight. Please join me in welcoming Sarah Merck and Aaron L. Thompson. I'm Sarah, that's Aaron, because you can't tell us apart. Um, it's a small crowd tonight, but that's okay. I love a small crowd because it means you guys care and you're really interested. So thanks for coming out. Either that or you're our friends. <laughs> if you're not, you're gonna be. <laughs> so thanks for coming out. Um, Aaron's book, Smashing Statues, is extremely interesting, brilliant, uh, just like one of my favorite books I've maybe ever read about history and about the United States and about art. So thanks for making it, Erin. Well, thank you. <laughs> I'm just here to compliment it. Um, so I'm gonna ask Erin a bunch of questions. We'll look at some cool photos, um, some historical stuff, and um, we'll just talk through a bunch of monuments and their history in the United States. And then if you guys have any questions, you drop them into the app that Ware just talked about, and it shows up on this iPad. So I can ask Erin those questions as we're going along, or at the end. So if you have any burning questions that come into your brain, drop them in the app. I'll ask Aaron. Um, does that sound good? We're all good? Okay. Um, Aaron, let's start off talking about your book. Um, so this, this book is about uh, you know, the, the controversial history of monuments in the United States and specifically looking at how the history of a lot of monuments is intertwined with white supremacy. So you're a professor of art crime how did you get started working on this topic? Uh, so I'm interested in a lot of the intersections between art and the law, of which there are a surprising amount. Um, I started off being interested in the illicit market for antiquities, looting and smuggling, art forgery, then expanded to museum security. I could teach you how to steal a painting, but then I'd have to catch you afterwards. Um, and uh, a big part of my career has been through chance. So I know you because of your work on Guantanamo. Um, I started to work on uh, art made by detainees at Guantanamo because a friend of a friend is a lawyer who represents Guantanamo detainees and, and called me up and said, do you want to display some of this art that my clients are making at Guantanamo? And I thought, what do you mean that detainees are making art at Guantanamo. Of course I have to. Um, so that sort of um, happenstance and the spark of curiosity is what um, uh, shapes a lot of my work. And the same thing came about through this book. So uh, my girlfriend makes really good cocktails. And I had two of them and then opened Twitter, which is never a good idea. And I saw a video of an activist throwing rope around the neck of a statue in um, St. Paul, the state capital, and uh, I tweeted something like, as someone who studies the deliberate destruction of art and cultural heritage, let me just say, you should use chain instead of rope if you want it to go faster, and that went viral. Uh, and uh, I got denounced by Tucker Carlson, which I'm very like, where does that go in my resume? <laughs> Uh, he accused me of leading armies of nihilists to destroy statues, and I said, you know. That sounds so cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, like, I wish. Where are my armies of nihilists? The only nihilists I know are my kids, and they don't even pay attention about, like, it's time to put on PJs. So, 
Um, but uh, what was really interesting to me is in that, uh, to that tweet, there were thousands of replies and people started arguing about questions that I thought were pretty settled, like, what's so wrong about Columbus, for example? Um, but saying things like, oh, it's, it's anti-American to take down a statue, or it's barbaric, or this is unprecedented. And as a, a classicist, you know, I, everything that I studied has, has been torn down by somebody and thrown in a pit at one point or another. Uh, and so I knew all right, there's this, this deeper history that I think in America we have forgot um, uh, that every time power changes, there, the, the decorations of that previous power regime get taken down. And in fact, the very first metal statue ever put up in America, um, a lead uh, statue of George the third that went up in New York's Bowling Green uh, lasted for only seven years before New Yorkers heard the Declaration of Independence read, tore that down, chopped him up and melted him into bullets to fight the, the uh, British Army. So we had at one point a sort of proud tradition of, of revamping our, our public artworks and um, because the so many of our traditional public artworks since then so, um, were put up to support precisely this ideology of white supremacy. It's no surprise that now that we as a nation are starting to question that, those monuments should start to be questioned. And it's no surprise they lasted that long because that way of looking at who should hold power in America really has lasted for, for a long time. Yeah, I was really struck by that story in your book about how the very first statue put up in the United States as a monument was torn down shortly thereafter and melted down into bullets for the Revolutionary War. So if somebody's arguing that tearing down statues is anti-American, like it doesn't get more American than that. Um, and you, you also- You could even say that's American. Yeah. <laughs> and you start out the book talking about this statue called Freedom. And I was hoping you could talk about that statue a little bit and show us some, some pictures of it and just tell us like um, what you found so interesting about the history of the statue and, and what it can teach us. So the, I'm showing you here um, on top of the US Capitol building is a statue uh, that's an allegorical representation of freedom. Here's a bit closer so you can see she's got like this Vegas y headdress, like a showgirl. Um, uh, and I was uh, very interested in how this statue reveals the value of digging deeper into not just what's represented on a monument, but the monument itself as an artwork. So how did that particular piece come to be? Um, so this is a bronze monument. It was first sculpted in plaster um, as a model, and then the federal government commissioned this guy. Um, Clark Mills, who is a sculptor, to cast it into bronze, uh, which was still a very big deal at the time. Um, work on this project launched shortly before the Civil War broke out, and Mills was the very first uh, American who had figured out how to make a bronze monument um, in America, though there had been very few in America before, and they had been imported from Europe. So he made this. Um, Thingamabob, uh, which is a monument to Andrew Jackson. It still stands in front of the White House. Um, and it took many years of trial and error, experimentation, uh, and he finally figured it out, uh, mainly by hiring um, European foundry workers uh, and then taking the credit also. <laughs> very American thing to do. Um, and uh, it, you can see he looks a little bit like a dashboard, uh, like bobblehead to me. Like if you flip the horse on the nose that it, Andrew Jackson would go back and forth. Um, but Mills did this to show off that he could balance the horse on two legs, which was like everybody lost their minds. They thought it was super awesome. Congress voted him a huge reward, like a bonus payment. And then a lot of um, replicas got commissioned, so he made more money from that. People wanted to have their portraits done. He um, became incredibly successful. Uh, he uh, built himself uh, an estate in, uh, just outside DC with this crenellated octagonal workshop, just real like uh, 19, mid 19th century bling right there. He had pet elk, because that's what you do apparently. Um, and he also used his newfound wealth to buy uh, additional people. 
Uh, so Mills already, uh, when he was casting Jackson, owned two uh, enslaved people, and then he bought more. This is what I'm showing you, the document he used to claim compensation from the federal government after the District of Columbia Emancipation Act freed the, the people that he owned. And he described them all here. The one who he claims the most money for was a man named Philip Reed, whom he had owned since Reed was a boy, um, bought him in the South, uh, and Reed worked his whole life as uh, Mills's foundry assistant. So it was um, astonishing to me to think of how does the meaning of this statue of freedom, which is still on top of the Capitol building, right, which is still symbolizing freedom to us today, how does it change that statue to know that someone whose labor was so important to it was enslaved, uh, was forced to make a representation of liberty that he himself did not have. Um, the document next to it is uh, the document that Reed uh, the receipt Reed put in to claim uh, money from the federal government uh, after he was freed. Uh, he claimed money for a year's worth of Sundays because he could keep the money that he made when enslaved um, on Sundays. Uh, so here's his sort of sole remaining uh, signature is just an X. Um, and someone wrote next to it, Philip Reed, his mark. Uh, so I think these type of hidden histories uh, are deeply meaningful. It, it certainly came to, as no surprise to me to be researching this during January 6th, um, that, that a white supremacist could take over the Capitol building is in, in part because the decoration of the Capitol building is, is put there to put forth a white supremacist version of, of who should be free in America, who should run America. Um, the decoration of the interior of the Capitol um, Rotunda is all about the triumph over indigenous peoples in, in America, et cetera. So I think we have a lot of, of reconsidering of, of the messages that continue to be broadcast from our monuments. Yeah, and a lot of what you're doing in your work is trying to find those people who are often left out of the historical record. You know, people who didn't have the platform at the time to you know, talk about their work publicly or to write books about it or even get their photograph taken. So how in this in this book did you try and sort of bring out the stories or voices or or center those people who are left out of the historical record in some way um, rather than just reiterating what the like famous white sculptors have already said? Right, or re without reiterating what other um, activists and writers of color have been saying for forever. Um, you know, so at first I thought, oh, I'll write a, a book explaining how bad these statues are. And then I realized, like, you know, Frederick Douglass, upon the unveiling ceremony of the Freedmen's Memorial in DC, was like, this is BS. Um, the, it shows an emancipated man, like nearly nude, crouching at the feet of President Lincoln, who's handing him emancipation as a gift. And, and Douglas wrote about, you know, for once in my life, I would like to see a black man represented standing on his feet, not crouching like an animal on all fours. It's like, okay, this message has been out there for a long time. There have been scrutiny of that. What can I do that's not just like, Columbusing the, um, you know, taking credit for what, what people have been saying and, and been ignored for so long. So something that I tried to do was make original contributions, um, look into this history in a way that could provide information for, for others fighting the fight. And also um, I tried to focus a lot on more uh, of a critical eye on the role of um, messages these monuments gave to white audiences because I think there's been an assumption that the, the monuments celebrating white supremacy are like pats on the back to white audiences but that's not true for white working class audiences. A lot of these monuments, especially Confederate monuments, were put up to um, show the proper place of the working class as, as one uh, that was argued by the monuments to be of obedience to their to their betters, quote unquote. Yeah, you have a whole section in the book talking about Confederate monuments, which I think the chapter is just called Shafts, which I appreciate. I, I couldn't resist. And um, 
And what's interesting about that they bring out about that history is how is like these sculptures were pulled up at a time um, both to like uh, justify the narrative that the white supremacist creators were telling about their version of history, as well as to stoke uh, divisions within society between white people and black people who should have had a common interest at that time economically. For instance, you're talking about uh, coal miners in, in Alabama um, and across the South. C can you talk about how these Confederate monuments that were put up in the early 1900s uh, were both about like kind of trying to justify this sort of revisionist view of history as well as to create division moving forward? And, and that project also felt to me uh, on a personal level, like coming for my people, <laughs> you know, like there uh, are so many Confederate monuments uh, were put up by organizations of white women. So it's like, okay, can I, can I try and walk some of that back? Uh, I'm showing you here a picture of um, some Southern beauties uh, who appeared at a Confederate veterans reunion in Birmingham, Alabama in the late um, 19th century, uh, just as an illustration of how important um, white womanhood was for the formation of the historical memory of the Confederacy um, as something pure and worth preserving. Um, there would always often be um, groups of young eligible uh, women like this who would appear at various Confederate events to sort of symbolize in their bodies um, what the Confederacy was supposed to mean. And then once you got married, you would uh, get uh, to work uh, being part of the United Daughters of the Confederacy. Um, who, who had chapters in um, many, many cities across the South who were responsible for organizing to put up Confederate monuments. There's the one in uh, Atlanta, Georgia in the early 20th century. Uh, and they would put up monuments like this. They put up so many that uh, the UDC, the United Daughters of the, of the Confederacy would refer to them by shorthand just as shafts because they were, um, oops. My other picture is not coming through, uh, but you can you can imagine it's a it's a big uh, shaft of stone with uh, this guy on top. Uh, this is at the North Carolina State Capitol. No longer he's currently in storage, but um, he's put up in the late 19th century um, by a group of of local rally uh, sort of elite women uh, working together to raise the funds for this and to persuade. Um, the state legislature to donate the funds because uh, women were seen as the appropriate people to do, you know, this artsy thing. Um, but also, um, you, how could you say no to a woman? So this I write about in the book because it was fascinating um, because they, the, the group of women who wanted to make this monument got a first grant from the state legislature and then they went back to ask for another grant to finish off the monument. Uh, and the legislature said no, uh, because um, there had just been elected a new, more um, diverse uh, group of state legislatures in this sort of relatively brief period uh, of the post-war when there was real black civil participation. Uh, and they were like, no, we're not gonna pay for this gigantic monument to someone who wanted to kill us. Um, and there was a huge uh, scandal. Uh, there were things like this is one of the more conservative um, rally newspapers at the time put out this cartoon contrasting what had happened a few days before the vote when um, the state legislature had had essentially like a moment of silence um, uh, to honor the death of Frederick Douglass. Uh, and so this, this newspaper cartoon is saying, oh, these state legislatures, they care more about Frederick Douglass than they do about the women of their town. And they're saying, no, we won't give you the money to honor the Confederate dead. It's, it's not your dead, but our Fred. Frederick Douglass that, that we care about. Uh, and this caused such a scandal that the, the um, legislature reversed itself because there were a lot of um, more liberal white legislatures who were allying um, with the, the new, um, uh, uh, you know, the, their sort of a farming interest, et cetera, that were opposed to the, the more conservative pro-Confederate um, 
continuing politicians, and they just like cut bait um, on the allyship with the the black state senators, and were like, "Just kidding, we can't actually do this. This is too um, divisive an issue." So they gave the women uh, a bunch of money to finish this monument. Uh, so the role of white women in these monuments was really intense, but it's not that they were meaningless to white men. In fact, they were very um, important in putting forth this view of the world, which I illustrate in the book with the Birmingham um, Confederate monument, uh, which I'm showing you here. Again, a shaft I did not put in the book, but uh, I, it, it um, really cost me to cut it out. But there's a hilarious um, uh, like 1905 newspaper article talking about how the women are all so enthused about the prospect of the erection of this shaft in the, <laughs> the park in, in Birmingham. So I'll just, I'll just tell you about it because it's hilarious. Um, but anyways, um, this monument was put up in two parts, um, the base and then the shaft. You see why I, like, I, I have a dirty mind here. Uh, uh, about nine years apart in, in the late 19th century and then the early 20th century, both in reaction to a threatened strike by Birmingham era, era um, miners, coal and iron miners. Uh, and in both cases, um, they were uh, the, the fundraising effort, the big ceremonial unveiling, um, was because uh, to send a message not only of obedience, um, f uh, the dedication speeches are all about how the Confederate soldier obeyed his officer, um, but they were uh, speeches about how the Confederates had died to uh, avert the what one speaker called the hideous specter of threatened race equality, and that their audience, Confederate veterans, the sons and daughters of Confederate veterans, should uphold the, these values um, that their fathers, that their grandfathers had fought for. Uh, the message essentially being like, the color line is more important than your economic well-being. There's a lot of talk about the sacrifice of Confederate veterans, et cetera. Uh, so Birmingham era miners led very segregated lives. Just to illustrate that, here's a, a, a photo of some Birmingham era uh, area um, uh, segregated bathhouses. So they lived in different neighborhoods. They rode different buses or trains to work. They bathed in different bathhouses when they were done. They played on segregated baseball teams and in brass bands, but the union persuaded them in both of these strikes um, to work together. Uh, but these monuments were put up as part of the effort to what would ultimately successfully be a breaking of both of these strikes. Yeah, and maybe the most controversial and well-known monument that you talk about in the book is Stone Mountain. And there's, if, if you guys don't know, maybe you can explain what Stone Mountain is. Um, but also, there's all these debates right now over should this monument be taken down, should it be kept up? And there's a lot of people that say, oh, if you take down this monument, you're erasing history. So can you tell us a little bit about the backstory of Stone Mountain and what history it does encapsulate? And then also, what's your response to people who say that removing a monument is, is censorship or is a form of erasing that history? Stone Mountain is the world's largest Confederate monument, the world's largest uh, relief sculpture, and also they will boast proudly currently the world's largest laser spectacular. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes. Um, you can go uh, and pay way too much money, as I discovered last weekend, um, to view uh, a laser show uh, projected on top of a, a monument honoring um, Robert E. Lee, Jefferson Davis, and Stonewall Jackson, who are shown riding across the granite face of a mountain uh, a, a few miles outside of Atlanta. Uh, the laser show, by the way, is very little about history. There's a lot of Star Wars in it. Wow. Uh, I did Dol not expect that mashup. No. <laughs> I mean, I kind of expected the Dolly Parton, but not, not the Star Wars yeah. so much. Um, unfortunately, no alcohol isn't allowed in Stone Mountain, oh. so... Really. So it was, a, it was a sober laser show on Robert E. Lee's face projected on a mountain. 
Yes, with um, a trick unicyclist performing as the opening act. Wow. There are also animatronic dinosaurs. <laughs> wow, that sounds it's wild. A, it's quite the experience. Uh, but it's always been quite the uh, weird experience because as I dug into the history, um, this monument, the idea for the monument um, stems from 1914, uh, but it wasn't actually completed until 1972. There was a long break um, at, because it was essentially a, a way for a variety of, of artists and local um, sort of organizers to scam people's donations uh, when they weren't also busy scamming people's donations by being clan members. So the first um, sculptor of Stone Mountain a man named Gutzen Borglum, who would go on to sculpt Mount Rushmore um, enthusiastically, even though he was um, the, the son of immigrants. He lived in Connecticut. He had named his son Lincoln, and yet he joined the Klan to sort of get in good with the, this fundraising opportunity um, and managed to have a lot of money disappear in connection with this monument. So there's a pause. The monument was only restarted in 1958 when the state of Georgia bought it as part of the new governor's um, resistance to federal integration. So um, Governor Griffin changed the state flag to include the, the Confederate battle flag, and then he bought Stone Mountain to recarve the, to the memorial project to, to serve as what he called a rallying point um, for, for those of us who still believe in the ideals of our forefathers, i.e. Um, the Confederacy. Uh, so a strange origin of um, what's now Georgia's most visit tour visited tourist site, not so much because of the monument, but because of the animatronic dinosaurs and the laser show and, and the other stuff also. I guess there's just not that much else to do. Uh, it's a nice nature trail, though. I recommend it. Uh, it's a little weird to be walking up a mountain on a nice nature trail knowing that the members of the clan also took the same path to um, give rebirth the clan in 1914. Um, and the monument itself is just um, the three Confederate figures. It doesn't teach you anything about them. Um, one of my favorite facts about that uh, the monument is that even the Grand Wizard of the Imperial Knights of the Clan in the um, 80s uh, said that the monument was a disgrace to society, although his objection was to Lee's horse. He didn't think it was a good portrait of, of Lee's um, famous horse. It is really hard to draw a horse. It's, yeah, it's yeah. Tricky. No, no one can do it, <laughs> even on the side of a mountain. <laughs> And so when, when people say, well, aren't we going to lose history? Won't history be erased by this monument? I, I want to ask, well, what, what are you learning from this particular monument? It's not a history book. Um, it is more often true that monuments erase history by going up than by coming down because there's... Uh, th I think monuments often have the privilege of being boring, so they make you stop asking questions about a thing. You're like, okay, fine, yeah, we respect these people, whoever they are. Um, uh, it sort of normalizes the adulation of the Confederacy, um, and the the one historical part of the laser show is shows Lee being looking very sadly at a dead soldier and burning buildings and taking out his sword and breaking it to surrender and then the pieces fly around and come back up and you see they're in the shapes of the southern and the northern states and then they come together and, and merge so it's like oh the confederacy is the foundation of american unity is apparently the lesson we're this supposed is to learn. a really intricate laser show i was just imagining like stars or something but no, yeah. this is no Pink Floyd. Yeah. This is really, it goes on for freaking ever. There are flame cannons involved. Whoa. Yeah, <laughs> lots of fireworks. But I think that's, I just, I really like what you said about how monuments like more often erase history by going up than by coming down. And in the book you talk about people who are trying to get monuments removed and trying to go through legal channels to do that and not having any avenue to do that. So can you talk a little bit about efforts to remove monuments? Like I think you're showing one of Columbus right now um, in St. Paul. And like how when people resort to tearing down a monument, people often say, 
we should go through the legal channels to do that. But what did you find about the legal channels of this one in particular? Yeah, so I'm not leading armies of nihilists, nor am I recommending that people do what Mike Forcha is doing here in this picture, um, throwing rope around the neck of a statue and pulling it down. Um, that's dangerous. Y'all can get hurt. Please don't do that. Um, but the alternative is not, well, just use the legal channels or you know follow the right procedure because often that doesn't exist. So um, most of the former Confederate states have very strict laws specifically prohibiting the removal of um, Confederate monuments, and then basically all monuments fall under these. So the Birmingham monument that I showed you a little while back came down in 2020. It was the very first official decision to remove a monument after the death of George Floyd. But the mayor of Birmingham, Randall Woodfin, who made that decision, was breaking the law to do that. Um, the city had to pay a fine and he, um, when he made the decision, was, was worried about being criminally prosecuted and maybe removed from office um, so because the laws are so tough. But even in other states that don't have these specific protections of monuments, the absence of any procedure almost makes it more difficult to get a monument removed uh, because nobody's sure who has the authority to make the decision or et cetera, et cetera. So, so Forcha, who I had the privilege of interviewing to do a sort of profile of, of him in this statue for one of the chapters of the book, for his essentially entire adult life had been protesting the statue, had been asking for it to be um, removed, recontextualized, put up some more signage, um, explain why uh, someone whose arrival, not even in America, because Columbus never set foot uh, on, on North America, but whose arrival in the New World, um, quote unquote, uh, set forth a uh, huge amount of, of suffering, um, why he was being honored in the state capital of, of one of the largest um, concentrations of urban indigenous people in America. Um, and Forcha was always told like, okay, here's the procedure, you know, submit this, contact this person. Um, and then after he finally um, did this in t the summer of 2020, um, he the, finally the authorities came out and said, okay, there, there really never was any procedure. They were just sort of ignoring all of his demands. So I think if there's not a way for um, people to know that their concerns are being heard, it's not going to be surprising that people will commit what the prosecutors ultimately deemed to be an act of civil disobedience, like in this case. Mm -hmm. And we have a couple of questions from the audience that I'll just ask you right now, because I like them. So thanks for asking questions. Um, and one really nice one is, what kind of monuments do you think America is missing? Is there anything you would like to see or that you felt inspired to, to suggest in the world? My answer to this question actually changed over the last week. Oh, wow. All right, so my previous answer was that um, I uh, am not very sanguine about the possibility of figural monuments, uh, especially after doing all of this research. Uh, one of the, the people who influenced my thoughts on this was there is um, a, an activist and journalist, um, an author named uh, Friedman H. M. Murray, who wrote a book in 1916 collecting all of the examples he could find of representations of African Americans in public sculpture, and it wasn't very many. Uh, and like continuing Douglas's uh, criticism of sculpture, he 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 found the stereotypes, the insidious messages that they were portraying about the relationship between Black and White Americans. Essentially, his argument is that these monuments um, portray black Americans like what white Americans wished they were as sort of sub subordinate second-class citizens who were willing to be told what to do um, instead of say being shown as, as fighting for their freedom um, and indeed the participation of black men in the Union Army was was high and crucial for example so they weren't just waiting to be handed freedom as a gift. They were, they were seizing it on their own. Uh, so Murray uh, ends his book by saying, well, that he doesn't think that 
any single person or any single moment in time can represent truly the complexities of subjects like emancipation or the, the role of African Americans in American history. So he recommended um, abstraction, uh, or not abstraction, sorry, allegorical representation, uh, like the allegorical representation of, of freedom we saw before, for example. Um, but it's, it was 1916, so abstract uh, ideas had not yet really come in. So I think n nowadays we, we know that artists have a much broader toolbox than just the human figure to represent concepts. Think of Maya Lin's uh, Vietnam Memorial. Uh, we have seen really moving uh, monuments as just light or greenery, gardens, fountains, etc. You can do a lot of things that aren't just dude on a horse. And I feel like a lot of the debate these days has been, okay, we took down one dude off of the horse, now who else do we put up on the horse? You know, <laughs> sort of uh, keeping the idea of the traditional monument. But I think, you know, no matter how cool the person up on the horse, not everybody's gonna be able to see themselves mm -hmm. represented there. So maybe it's time to do something a little bit more abstract. But my, my answer changed though, because um, uh, when I visited Stone Mountain and I climbed up, the, the hike to the top of it. It's a, it's a pretty gentle mountain. It's a little slopey, but there's one really steep part. And I kept thinking about how uh, in my research, I had read about the um, first workers who carried up all of the materials needed to make the scaffolding to hang from the cliff, to carve um, the cliff. Um, they did this in the late 19 teens. The slope of the cliff was too steep for trucks or even mules. Um, so these were men who were carrying um, gigantic um, steel rods and beams of, of wood up this really steep slope. It's, it's so steep that they put in railing now and then almost everybody just plops on a rock at the top and is like, oh my God, I can't believe I made it. And then everybody's talking to each other like, okay, you could do it just a little bit more. Um, and you feel it in your body, the effort. And so to think about this workforce who are mainly black, some you know, descendants of enslaved people uh, uh, who were working to, again, to make this monument to the Confederacy, um, who were not never permitted to do any artistic work, were just labor, uh, but who were doing these incredible feats of of bringing these materials up. The the air compressor for the carver's drills was so heavy it took two days to get up the slope, um, and a pair of workmen crawled on hands and knees beside it the whole way to make sure the roll the rollers underneath stayed in line. So I could see a monument there um, honoring those men. Uh, where everybody kind of can plop down on the, the steps of that monument and think about like, man, those those people were, were intense. Yeah, so perhaps like a bench that's a monument to like yes. all the workers who <laughs> built this previous monument. Monumental bench, there, I'm, yeah. I'm still practical, okay. I mean, it's not a dude on a horse, it's a bench. Yeah, I, I love the idea of conceptualizing monuments as being gardens or light or water or something that's not like a, a person that you're putting up on a literal pedestal. Uh, but thinking about how to be creative that way. Um, we have another question from the audience, um, which is, uh, are monuments still being built? And what kind of monuments do you see being do, being made today? And any thoughts on them? Yes, um, and I, I do have thoughts. Uh, I, I will say that when I wrote the book proposal, uh, I said that the last chapter would be about like what monuments should be, like new monuments, and then I started writing as like, okay, nope, I do not know. Uh, <laughs> but I, I have some thoughts on some aspects. So first of all, uh, there have been some really exciting monuments announcements, but I, because I am cynical and grumpy about everything, are cynical and grumpy about them because I think all too often the pattern is continued where monuments are sort of airdropped into a community without a whole lot of consultation with that community. So, for example, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, um, then governor of New York, uh, Andrew Cuomo, announced a few days later, okay, there's going to be a monument to her in, in Brooklyn, in her, her hometown. And, you know, I, I love a good RGB as much as anybody else, but it's like, who, who asked for that? Um, shouldn't a community get to decide 
what it wants to to look at all of the time. Uh, and maybe they decide on Ginsburg, maybe they decide on, on somebody else. Uh, so I think there needs to be more consultation because the name public monuments is, is a bit of a misnomer. Um, they're not usually brought about by any public process of, of consultation. It's usually people who are rich enough to afford to donate one and powerful enough to ensure a place in public for them. Um, that said, there have been some really exciting projects, particularly to um, transform older monuments. So in Charlottesville, there's the Swords into Plowshares initiative. Uh, the Charlottesville City Council finally uh, was able to remove the statue of Robert E. Lee that had been at the center of the 2017 Unite the Right rally and had been held in place by uh, some lawsuits after that. Uh, they removed it and they gave it to the Jefferson School, a local nonprofit um, who has proposed to melt it down uh, and give the bronze to an artist who will be commissioned to work with the community to come up with an idea for a new monument that will better reflect the community, that will bring them together instead of uh, trying to divide them, the original Lee statue having been put up in the 1920s as part of an anti-interracial marriage campaign. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of creative thinking that can happen um, and that might happen or I don't know, maybe we'll, we'll do something else. Uh, yeah. Sometimes I joke that we can melt them all down and turn them into slides so then I can have something for my kids to do. <laughs> yeah, we could use more slides for sure. Okay, one other question from the audience, um, and then we'll talk about some other stuff. But what was um, a specific piece or monument or statue that inspired your work? Is there somewhere that you started where you saw something and you were like, ooh, I want to write about that? I got to a point where I was, I was just like, Arr! pulling the car aside every time I'd see a monument, which is in America is, is a lot. Yeah. Be like, I want to know about that one, because every one that I would look into had some fascinating backstory of, the, yeah, they seem very boring. I think they're not. I know when to cut myself off. Um, so I don't uh, bore everybody with all of my facts, but I, I think they are. And I encourage everybody to, to research um, the monuments you see in your own community to find out, you know, find out who put them there, who designed them like that. Um, and uh, if the one in your own community isn't uh, interesting enough, you can go Google what Sarah just showed me in the green room, which is Mother Iowa. Yeah, when I was in college, I took a class on monuments and political memory. And we studied this sculpture called Mother Iowa. Has anyone seen Mother Iowa? It's at the Iowa State Capitol. And um, it's, it's one of the most sexual statues I've ever seen. <laughs> It was put up as a, um, it's on the bottom of a Civil War memorial. So it's a shaft with like a soldier on top. At the bottom, there's this like twice bigger than life size woman um, who it was originally, the sculpture was originally a contest that uh, was like um, judged blind, meaning they didn't know who submitted the ideas. And the person who won was a woman, a woman sculptor, which at the time was really rare. And she designed a, a statue. And, um, but it was really controversial because the, the group actually didn't want to have a woman sculptor. And then tragically, she died, and um, the they hired a European man to come and design, like finish the design. And he just threw out her design and made a new one, which was um, an allegorical representation of Mother Iowa, which was like a woman who is topless with like giant breasts riding a cornucopia, and that's on the Civil War memorial, and so. <laughs> That inspired my work because I saw that statue and I was like, what the heck is going on here? How did this get made? And um, I think it really speaks to how, I don't know, we we kind of think that if something's a, a statue or a monument, like, oh, it must have this like important in-depth history. And I'm like, I don't know. I think this was just some dude who was like, here's my idea, you know? And I think a lot of your work, I mean, a lot of the statues you point out in your book are things that were designed not very long ago, you know, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, and now it's held up as this kind of like, oh, this is history, we can't touch this. And I like that you point out that like, look, this was made by humans with very human motivations, mostly of making money at the time. And so um, it's not some sort of like, like uh, precious 
history that we can't touch. Instead, we can interact with it. Yeah, it's like by putting something in the category of art, suddenly you remove it from no one can ever touch it again. But that's that's not true. And I mean, Stone Mountain, not finished till 1972. My grandparents have shag carpeting that's older than that. You know, I think we could change it up. We can redecorate our nation just a little bit. Yeah. And I, I know about your work um, from a few years ago when you put together this super interesting art show that I wanted us to talk about, which was art from people who were imprisoned at Guantanamo Bay. And so people who are in prison at Guantanamo Bay, you know, there's been about 780 people in prison there. They make a lot of interesting art. And you were able to get photographs as well as some of the actual art, I think, and put it up at, for an exhibition at John Jay College. And I was just hoping you could tell us a little bit about uh, how art matters there and like what stories you were hoping to tell with that exhibition. Yeah, if you want to know more about this art, there's a, a website that I made uh, artfromguantanamo.com and the, an expanded version of the show is currently at Old Dominion University and will be at the Catamount Art Center in uh, St. Johnsbury, Vermont this summer and then hopefully traveling elsewhere. If you have any ideas, let me know. Uh, so I'm showing you here uh, one example by an artist, Badr Rabani, who was just cleared for release last year. Um, so never charged with a crime, essentially the authorities were like, whoops, we didn't have any reason to detain you for 15 years in the first place. Um, and he spent, he's still at Guantanamo um, because it takes, the, the, re the release process then can take years. Uh, and I think that this painting that he made speaks to the scrutiny that he has felt that he is under. Um, and here's uh, another Daniel Amazian's shipwreck boat. Um, he's been out uh, released for a while, again, never charged uh, with a crime. And once he went, uh, was released, he told his lawyers that this painting that he had painted at Guantanamo, he felt was a, a self-portrait. Um, he couldn't um, speak freely while he was there, but he could paint, he could draw. Um, and he felt like he was being torn apart by the waves like this ship. Um, uh, and here is a, a model ship made by the artist Moath al Alawi, who just in January was cleared for release. Uh, you can see that the sails of the ship, which he made with scraps of old t-shirts stiffened with glue, are stamped um, by the censors to make sure, um, like all of the art that has come from Guantanamo, that there's no hidden message or, you know, secret instructions to whatever hidden in the squiggles of a flower. It's just, it's just art. Um, and uh, uh, always says that when he makes these ships, which take months and months of, of work to complete, um, that he can imagine himself free. Um, so art was, and, and has been, because again, he's still there, um, uh, incredibly important in terms of a way of, of keeping themselves sane, of communicating with the outside world, of um, knowing that other people were looking at their art and thinking of them as artists and not just as, as monsters, as the worst of the worst, uh, et cetera. So when I came into this Monuments project, it's because I know the power of connection and messages that art can send, um, but sometimes that power, that, that power can be used for, for different ways. Yeah, and this, um, this show had such a big impact, I think, on the world, on me, um, and also on the people who made the art at Guantanamo. Can you, can you explain what happened to this ship after the art show? Uh, yes, yeah, so being denounced for um, encouraging people, which I was not, I was just commenting on uh, destruction of statues, is not actually the very first time that I've created controversy by being an art historian. Like, come on. Um, the first time was when I curated this show, um, which was um, just as Trump was coming into office, and uh, the uh, Pentagon announced um, th that they wouldn't let any more art leave Guantanamo and that um, what remains might be burnt, which is really not a good PR move. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so a, a lot of people started to visit the show and look at the art online. There are like hundreds of media stories um, about what was it about this art that was so threatening and that they, you, there is nothing. There's 
mainly paintings of flowers and nature uh, and ships in the sea. What's threatening is the message that the art communicated that its maker is a, is a human being who likes pretty flowers and, and the sea and et cetera. So um, the whole uh, existence of Guantanamo is premised on that it's protecting us from the worst of the worst. Um, and the idea that most of the hundreds of men who have been there have never been charged with a crime were sold there um, for the sake of the rewards that American authorities were were um, offering, et cetera, were caught up in cases of mistaken identity or et cetera. Um, that is inconvenient information that um, goes against the picture of Guantanamo in the public eye. Um, so again, similarly to my interest in monuments, what, how is history shaped? Um, we've seen this operating quickly with the history of 9-11, how that appears in, in public memory. Um, and so going to the, the history of the Civil War, the history of a Western expansion, um, it was just pushing a little deeper into seeing the same strategies at work in public memory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot about that question of like, who shapes our history and what role does art play in that? And so we have a few more slides from um, this artist. Oh, I should click. Am I clicking? Okay. Um, this artist was in Guantanamo named Mansour Adafi, who wrote a memoir about his experiences there. And I did this really interesting project with him where he um, wrote a story, this is part of his memoir, but about the animals that he encountered in Guantanamo and how the wild animals he met, they reminded him of his own humanity. So this, this comic is illustrated by the artist Kane Lynch and is published um, originally by the Nib and also in Guantanamo Voices, that book. Um, but this, I, I don't know, I just really loved working in this way because it reminded me of like, okay, we have this dominant narrative that's told about this group of people by the US government. It's sort of like, this is the textbook narrative that we have. And then how do their own experiences challenge that? You know, how does he, by telling his own story, push back on that? And I think that that's something that kind of plays into how like monuments and other big pieces of public art are interpreted where it's like, they're telling one story and, but there's actually, you know, millions of stories out there. So how, do, how does it challenge that kind of dominant narrative um, by having other people share their voices and share their stories? And in this case, I feel like, you know, the people who are in Guantanamo have been so dehumanized and stigmatized by the government that having them actually get to make a piece of art and share their story out there um, challenges that idea that we've been sold about who they are and, and what they've done. It really pushes back against that notion. So I'm pretty against having the kind of monument vision of history, which is just one, one story that's told and like, here's what happened, but instead interrogating like, who did the telling of that? Why did they make it? How was it made? Um, which is why I really appreciate your book. I think there's just a couple more panels here. And um, we have about, five more minutes. So if anyone else has questions, drop them in the app. Now is the time, now or never. And I think that's that for those ones. And I'll just well, ask- I, I like that t just today, just um, before this, we found out that uh, uh, this story that of Mansoor and the, the iguana named, that he named Princess, uh, he, he wrote about it because he was telling me about it on um, a Skype call. Uh, and I was like, Mansur, you need to write that, and we can we can get that published as a modern love column. And he's like, What's modern love? I'm like, Just forget about that. Just write it, and then we'll we'll get there. So it became, <laughs> uh, it was published as a yeah. modern love story because um, you know the idea of how do you keep up the idea of love under these most inhumane of circumstances, and then it became this wonderful. Uh, one of many wonderful stories in the book. I highly recommend Guantanamo Voices by Sarah Mark. Check it out. Uh, and uh, this sort of human connection and just showing interest mm -hmm. as a seed for him thinking, oh, maybe more people want to know more about my story mm -hmm. is I think the way we can, we can use the power of art instead of just having... Um, the power of Mother Iowa all yeah. of the time to tell us what to think about history. Yeah, and it's cool to hear about how your work with Guantanamo led you to this monuments book. 
Um, we just have one more question from people, which was, which is one I like to ask too. So thanks for asking this question. It's, what was the most challenging thing about writing this book? And I would say that I think that can include talking about this book and releasing it into the world too. Um, I wrote it during the pandemic. Um, and so I wrote it without ever being able to go to a library. Um, I ordered some books. I had this great uh, independent bookstore up in um, uh, Hanover, New Hampshire, Still North Books. It's a great place. Uh, and I am forever appreciating them for the books they ordered for me, including the ones where I had to send in little explanatory notes, like, I'm not ordering a book called Why Every American Should Know and Love Confederate Monuments, because I agree with that sentiment just for research. And they're like, sure, and, and gave it to me in a, wrapped in a brown, plain brown paper wrapping. Wow. <laughs> um, so I had to let go of the academic urge to read everything that everyone had ever thought about all monuments around the world uh, before I said anything and just had to be like, okay, this is, these are the ones where I can find as much information as possible. Um, like I wrote about Stone Mountain because not that many people have, have written extensively about it and because the Atlanta newspapers were digitized from the era so I could be comprehensive about it. But um, so far, I have not been told I've made any major factual uh, errors. Uh, it's going to come out in paper paperback, so if you have any corrections, please let me know. Now is the time to tell me all the typos. Um, uh, but I also, in a larger sense, had to let go of a perfectionism of uh, of wanting to put something out there only if I knew the solution. But I, it turns out, I don't know what monuments should look like. Here are just some pieces of, the, of information that I think are good for making decisions about monuments or being aware about them. And the stories were too intriguing not, not to share. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're out of time, so I'll just close with one last question, which is that I know when I go to talks, I have a really hard time paying attention and it just kind of washes over me. So if you're zoning out, what's like the big takeaway from your book? If you had to sort of be like, here's one message. If you didn't get anything else, get this. What would you say? Uh, I'd say if you're not rich enough to put up a monument, um, monuments are designed to tell you your place in society. And if you don't think that um, that's your place, you should use your, your voice to, to research the history of that monument, to ask for change. Uh, because now is a moment of change and nobody in charge has any idea what should happen. Um, nobody has the 10 point plan that's perfect for Stone Mountain. Uh, so it's, it's now time for everybody to uh, make their voices heard as we change America in many ways. Cool, well thank you, Erin. And thanks everybody for being here. That's it, we're done. Thank you. And Erin's gonna stick around and sign some books. So if you wanna talk monuments or ask more questions uh, and go buy a book, it's really good. Thank you.